So good evening. Um, I'm Andrew Miller. I'm a professor of systems biology at the University of Edinburgh here, not uh, uh, far to the south. But I'm here really only to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, professor Enrico Cohen was born in Liverpool in 1957 and studied genetics at the University of Cambridge. In 1984, he moved to the John Innes Centre in Norwich, where he is today working on the genetic control of plant development. He's the author of The Art of Genes, a critically acclaimed popular science book, and on the principles of development. And his several awards include the Science for Art Prize in 1996, the EMBO Medal, which is a research prize in 1996 also, the Linnaean Gold Medal, the Royal Society Darwin Medal in 2004. In 1999, Enrico was made professor in biology at the University of East Anglia, and Professor Kurd was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1998 and a Foreign Associate of the US National Academy of Sciences in 2001. So we're delighted to have him with us this evening to talk about uh, a, his book, Cells to Civilizations, which was shortlisted for the 2013 Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books. Enrico, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for that nice introduction, and thanks for inviting me here to this festival. Um, I'm going to try and talk about two things today. One is going to be science. Okay, so science is all about how understanding how the world works. And uh, as Andrew said, I'm I'm a professional scientist. I'm a biologist, and maybe some of you are scientists, or maybe you're just fascinated by science because it it tells us so much about this strange world that we live in. Um, but the other thing I'm going to talk about is culture. Uh, culture is all about what we as humans do in society. We, we walk, we talk, we, we have, tell stories, we come to talks like this, um, we have conversations, we build buildings, we create music, the clothes you're wearing are all aspects of culture, whether you particularly follow, follow fashions or don't follow fashions. These are all aspects um, that we attribute to culture. And our attitudes to, um, to science and culture often tend to be quite distinct. Okay? So science is often portrayed, as, as I think we'll see in this picture, um, as a rather impersonal, remote activity. Um, it's objective, it, it's detached, in a sense, from, from the world around us and has this rather cold, analytical feel. Whereas the way we think of culture often, and this is... Um, as I said, taken from a, a magazine, the Times newspaper. Um, the magazine, the Times also produces a, a culture magazine, which conveys a sort of more flamboyant, colorful, emotional, um, human approach uh, to the world. And what I'm gonna try and do uh, today is try and show you that maybe these two, these two domains of activity, the sort of science and culture, are maybe not as distinct as we sometimes think, and that they are actually both intimately connected and part of the way in which we interact with the world around us. Now, I'm a scientist, um, and I've ri ri written this book, as Andrew mentioned, about that covers a broad range of topics. Um, but before really going into these topics, I thought it might be useful to just give you a sense of what I do in my day job and how that sort of brought me to some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about. So my, uh, everyone has their obsessions. Um, and my obsession as a scientist is, is this, this flower, okay? I, 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 I've studied this flower for 30 years, uh, trying to understand how this flower is produced. And you might think, well, why would somebody bother, okay, studying something uh, as in sort of seemingly straightforward as a flower? I mean, we can produce things like iPhones, for example. So surely by now, scientists would have figured out how um, a flower, which is a snapdragon or antirhinum, um, how something like that is constructed and made. But the difference between a flower and an iPhone is that we, we know how to make iPhones. We make iPhones. But imagine that uh, you, know, you went to a shop and you said, I'd like a, a seed of an iPhone, please. And you take the seed home, you put it in some soil, you water it, and it, it grows into an iPhone. Well, you'd think that was miraculous. How did the iPhone make itself? I mean, that's, that just seems rem remarkable. Of course, we make them, so it's in a sense less remarkable because we impose the form of and the structure of the iPhone upon it. 
But a flower, as, as is a human or any other biological organism, forms itself. Okay? It organizes itself into a particular shape and structure. And we still don't understand many of the principles about how that works. But we've made a lot of progress. And um, what I want to do is try and convey the sorts of issues and, and way we now think about this problem. And as you'll see, that will lead me into the other issues that I'm going to touch upon. So what, what are the reasons that it's actually quite difficult to think about something like the, the formation of a flower is um, that we're dealing with something that grows, okay, and organizes itself. And most of the things around us don't grow, apart from biological things. I mean, you grew, okay, from, from a tiny fertilized egg, but the, the chairs that you're sitting on don't grow, this room doesn't grow, physical objects don't grow, and we're actually not very good, therefore, at thinking about how things grow and, and produce, produce particular shapes. And I thought I'd illustrate that with uh, an example. So I want you to imagine this is, this is made of a growing material. It's sort of meant to be a biological material, but I just think of it as a growing material. And it's a cylinder with, with a, a pink base, all right? So there's a base at the bottom. And think of this as a tissue that can grow. And what we're going to say is that each region of the tissue tries to grow equally in all directions, all right? So it tries to, ex to sort of expand, but it doesn't grow in thickness. So every, but each region's going to grow equally, try and grow equally in all directions. But we're going to have a rule such that in the orange regions, things are going to grow more slowly. And also in the pink region at the base, they're going to grow at a slower rate than the gray bits, okay, on the side. And what I'd like you to do in your head is imagine the shape that would be generated from such a set of rules, all right? So again, we're going to have gray regions trying to grow equally in all directions, okay, but not in thickness, but only in area, as it were, with the orange and the pink growing more slowly. So can you work out in your head the shape that you think might arise? And let's just see what actually would, would happen. Okay, so this is what would happen if you gave this tissue this set of rules. It sort of balloons out like this to produce a shape, a shape like that. Now, how many people, as a matter of interest, anticipated that this is what we would get? Could you put your hand up? All right, there are a few shapes, there are a few shapes, a few hands, I mean. Um, okay, so, but it's not straightforward, okay? It's not straightforward. Even, you might be able to understand in retrospect why it did this, okay? You might go, oh, yes, well, these... These regions were trying to grow more than the other regions were constrained, and that's why, why it did that. And the reason, one of the reasons that we're, we find it difficult is we're dealing not with just one region growing, we're dealing with a population of regions, all connected together, all kind of competing. So some regions are trying to grow fast, some regions are trying to grow slowly. And as a result of this competition, you end up with this uh, deformation, okay? And that's what's going on all the time in biological tissues. They're generating a, a series of shapes, often through rules that might be relatively straightforward. It's just that we're not very good at thinking about them. Now, in this case, we simplified things because every little region of tissue was trying to grow equally in all directions, which is why you're tending to see these things forming big circles. But actually, we know that in biology isn't straightforward, that, that things don't try and grow equally in all directions. Some directions of, of growth are preferred. And we know that in the case of our snapdragon from a rather remarkable mutation, a variety that was studied, that was known about actually in the 19th century. This is, it's a garden variety of variegated snapdragon. You see these nice white flowers with, with uh, these red, red spots on them. And you see them sometimes in gardens. Um, and the, the reason, if you look at what's going on in, this, on the, in these plants, is that we have what's called an unstable gene. That the, the, the flower starts off with essentially or, or is going to make a white flower, but as the flower grows, in the cells of the flower, as it's growing sporadically, a gene is, act, is restored so that it can produce the red color. And so what you're seeing are these stripes of color indicate what happened to, after a gene was restored and you generated a whole clone or, of cells, a progeny, from that in, individual cell in which the gene was reactivated. And the key thing I want to show you is that this, they're not round, okay? These, these patches are not round. They're elongated in certain directions. And we can see that more clearly if we, if we zoom in on, say, one of these petals, the lowest petal, and we, um, we activate this, this, uh, these events. I hope you can see here, I've enlarged one of, the, one, of these cell, one of these patches, and you can see this group of cells. Can you see the individual cells? Um, within the patch. That's because this is all originally one cell and then it grew, okay, within the petal. But the important thing is to note that it's not a round patch, 
it grew preferentially in this orientation. It grew faster in this orientation compared to this orientation. And if you look at all these patches on, the, on our tissue, you see they have a certain pattern of orientations. So our tissue is growing in certain directions, in certain preferred directions, some ways faster than other ways. So um, how do we explain that? Well, one way we now think about that is to imagine that in our tissue, we have, as it were, a field of orientation, so what we call a polarity field within our growing tissues, and these, these polarity fields are present also uh, in your own bodies and are, are, are maybe underle underlie the generation, not just of flowers, but of, of, of many organisms. And these uh, provide a set of internal orientations so that growth can be oriented according to this field, so that growth happens more in some orientations than in others. So now let's go back and just introduce that idea back to our growing cylinder. So we have the cylinder. We're going to have the same rules as before. But now we've got a, a field of arrows. And I, I want you to now predict the shape we're going to get. So we're going to grow faster um, in the gray regions again. But now we're going to grow, ori we're going to grow parallel to the arrows. We're going to tend to grow faster to in, in the orientation of the arrow compared to perpendicular to the arrow. Okay. So now try in your head to imagine the shape that you might get if we're growing faster in the gray regions and we're always tending to grow faster parallel to the arrows. Okay? And then we'll see what, what you figure out and what is actually the result. You see they're elongating, those circles are now elongating parallel to those arrows. So how many people got that right as a matter of interest? Okay, a few people. How many got both right? One person from the Royal Society over there. <laughs> um, but what it shows you is it, it's, not, it's again, it's because we're not used to think. It's not that um, this isn't an intelligence test. This is to do with the fact that we're just not familiar with the way these structures grow and how regions, populations of regions, of growing regions, interact and compete with, other, with you to compete with each other to generate these a particular shape through these conflicts uh, within, the, within the growing tissue. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how um, some of the issues and why it turns out that understanding how something like, as simple as a flower is not straightforward to understand. Um, but we also try and use other ways to try and get clues as to how um, these organizing principles operate. This, for example, is a, a mutant flower mutant snapdragon. This is the normal form, which we call the wild type. Here's a mutant form in which the flower is symmetrical. All right, same species, but now the flower has a very different shape. And that's because this um, mutant lacks a particular uh, set of genes that are needed normally to produce the normal shape of the flower. So we know quite a lot about not only how the flower changes shape, but also the genes that are underlying the changes in those shapes. And not only that, we know something about how these genes are active. Where, where are they switched on? Because at, at a given gene is not present, is not active in every cell of the body, whether it's a plant or an animal, but tends to be activated in certain regions rather than others. So where, for example, is this gene that we're seeing affected normally active? Well, if you slice, if you look at a very early flower bud, this is what a very early flower bud looks like. It looks like a uh, sort of loaf of, a tiny loaf of bread. These are the individual cells on the surface. And if you, at this stage, you don't see any petals, you don't see anything sort of very sort of significant, but yet this will form the flower. Okay. If you slice this uh, th through, make a section through this, through this loaf, tiny little loaf of cells, and you look at where this gene that I've just shown you is active, you'll see that it's only active in the upper part of the flower, what we call the dorsal region. It's, this blue color means it's telling you where the gene is active or switched on, and the rest of the flower, it's not switched on. So what that tells us is already our flower bud from a very early stage is already divided up into different regions of gene activity. And these regions of gene activity are somehow leading to the final shape. So when you inactivate these genes, you end up with a funny shape, a symmetrical flower, let's say, instead of a, uh, a, a normal flower. And every flower shape that you see in your garden, all right, or in somebody else's garden, is a consequence of these genes interacting. So how do they actually achieve what? the final shape. So what we do is we try and integrate these sorts of different types of observations about how things grow, about how genes are working, and arrive at a sort of model that tells us, that tells us how we generate 
a final form through sort of internal principles of growth. And uh, this sort of gives you the, uh, the sort of basic idea of this model. So we, instead of having a, a cylinder, a simple cylinder, we have the, we, our starting position is to have a cylinder with these five lobes that will end up as the five main petals of the flower. And this cylinder, or this region of tissue, this tiny bud, think of it as a tiny bud, is divided up into different regions of gene activity. So we have like the red region here where I just showed you the regions active in the dorsal or upper region of the flower compared to the ventral or lower region of the flower. That, that's the dorsal ventral axis. Then we have genes that vary as you go from the base towards the tip. And then we have other genes that vary from the middle of the petal outwards. And these genes, these different color combinations of genes, together with a system of polarities, orientations, allow us by controlling internally the way in which things grow, parallel or perpendicular to these arrows, we can generate the final shape through these self-organizing principles. And I'm just going to show you a movie of the shape that we generate, but this is I'm going to rescale the flower all the time to the same size so you can see what's going on. Hold on. So let me do this. Okay. So using these basic rules, then the flower can, as it were, organize its own growth. There's nothing being imposed here. It's being driven by its own internal local principles of growth. And we get something that um, looks like a flower. That's the sort of... Uh, we, you know, I took great pride and pleasure in, in um, discovering with, with colleagues, of course, ever, these things I'm telling you are not just my work, the work of, uh, with colleagues, how these principles work. This shows you the same thing, scaled without scaling, showing you how, by studying this process, you can arrive at certain principles through which a flower can grow. And um, nowadays, we're quite lucky because we can print out these things in 3D using 3D printers. So I thought I'd just show you one of these things. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is now, this is not the actual size of a flower. It's a bit bigger than a normal snapdragon flower. But this is the model. I don't know if you can see that um, shown in 3D. And I'm showing it to you because I want you to compare it to the original size of the flower that it starts off. So that's how it starts off and that's how it ends up. So just remember, when you look at something like a flower, how small they start off and how, just through growth, they can arrive at these complicated um, shapes. And of these principles we work out in flowers are uh, applicable to a whole, are not just applicable to flowers, they're applicable to animals, other flowers, uh, other, other organs. So what are the principles that we learn or learn about? Well, one is the notion that we have, the central idea, we have regions of tissue. Okay, little bits of tissue. They're all trying to do things. And one of the things they do is grow. Okay, the, each region tries to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But if that happened, then, then things would get out of control. So in addition to regions of tissue growing, um, the, you end up with competition. That One region of tissue pulls and competes with another region of tissue for the limited space available. All right? And so through this competition, we get these deformations, that things don't all grow uniformly. And we saw also that for this to work, we had to have population variation. We had to have populations of different tissue regions, not just one, but many, all uh, varying maybe in, in their growth properties. All right? And also, the, another key notion that you need is that these properties don't just ev evaporate as soon as they appear. We, we assign these properties early on, and they persist over time. Okay? So that the, the tissue develops with these behaviors through through these properties that persist. And these um, twin feedback loops, which we'll, we'll see appearing a number of times in, in this talk, um, which I, there's a positive loop and a negative loop, are really the fundamental logic of what is going on when you see a flower like that being generated. So I call these the twin feedback loops for how you might understand how a shape can emerge, a complex shape can emerge from um, relatively simple beginnings. Well, one of the things I showed you, uh, you might say, well, what about those patterns I gave you? I started off with a bud that already had patterns of red regions and yellow regions and all those, all, all those other aspects. But what, where did those patterns come from? How do we understand the formation of these colored patterns? So let's, um, the, the ideas behind how patterns are formed were first arrived at by uh, Alan Turing. He came up with a, an original idea about this. Turing is known mainly for inventing the computer um, and also for breaking the Enigma code. Okay? Uh, 
but, uh, so he was a mathematician. Uh, but he also came up with some interesting ideas about how some molecular interactions, just interactions, just simple interactions between molecules, can lead to the formation of a pattern spontaneously. So this, for example, is a sort of rather nondescript um, sheet of tissue in which we're seeing a concentration of molecules sort of with a noisy distribution over the tissue. There's no specific pattern. What Turing did was show that if you allow for certain interactions between these molecules, this will spontaneously turn itself into a defined pattern. This is known as the Turing system, and you're now seeing spots emerging, not because people are putting them there, nobody's telling those spots to go there. They're emerging as a consequence of these interactions between molecules. So, again, what are we dealing with here? Well, we're dealing with a population of things again, but we're, not, we're now dealing with a population, not of tissue regions, but a population of molecules. And these molecules are jigg jiggling around. Okay, and that's a key part of what's, of what's happening. The motion of these molecules, the diffusion of these molecules. And when we look at the logic of what's going on in Turing's um, model, his ideas, the, the, there is as follows. First of all, one of these, we have a certain type of molecule which we can call a self-promoting molecule. What does this self-promoting molecule do? What it does is it promotes more of its own production. So it's sort of, the, the, it tries to boost its own production. So we can think of this as through some sort of chemical reaction, the molecule makes more of itself. Okay, so if this, if this molecule carried on making more and more of itself, it would take over the world, all right, because it would just carry on getting more and more, um, more and more abundant. But the molecule doesn't do this because what also happens as part of this system is that the molecule becomes a victim of its own success. As it increases in, in, in abundance, it also produces an inhibitor that counteracts this increase. Or, so, or there's some other limitation that prevents the molecule from getting out of control. So again, we're seeing a positive loop here with something boosting itself and a negative loop with it, that boosting, bringing about competition and interactions. And again, we have the notion of population variation, but in this case, variation in molecules in their position through uh, things, processes like diffusion and uh, reactions. And there has to be persistence. The system doesn't work if it's stirred up too much. Okay? Things have to be relatively stable for this system to work. And I call this the sort of twin feedback, feedback loops for patterning. So we see the same logic as we saw before for growth. But now that what we're achieving is not differential growth and shape change, but we're achieving a patterning process, the, the arrangement of molecules in, in different distributions within a tissue, and this process or it could be responsible, for example, for the patterns that I started off with in my early flower bud. We also know that this sort of logic is responsible, for example, for creating nice patterns in the embryo of a fruit fly. And in fact, it's, in, it's responsible for creating the patterns in the embryos that gave rise to every one of you sitting here today. Okay, so these processes that I'm talking about, this fundamental logic that patterns uh, molecules is essential for our very existence because it, it's, it lies at the core of how our tissues become organized. So what I've tried to show you is uh, that when we look at the process of development of how something sort of relatively simple turns into something quite complicated during the process of development from say a fertilized egg into an embryo or a little tiny flower bud into a flower, we see some common principles emerging. First of all, we have some process of reinforcement, a positive loop where something's boosting itself. It could be a tissue or a molecule. And then that boosting brings about its own limitations, all right, through competition um, for space, competition or inhibition of one molecule by another. And that these loops are fed by population variation, population of regions, populations of molecules, and there's some persistence that keeps continuity going for these systems to work. So these are the, what are the process of development, which is a, uh, the transformation of a few simple cells into more complex cells. But where did this transformation itself come from? Okay, where did development come from? Why, why is it that flowers turn, you know, cells, buds turn into flowers, that cells turn into embryos, that embryos turn into, into babies? Um, well, this process of development is itself embedded in an, another process, another transformative process, and that's the process of evolution. 
So if you go back, say, a few billion years, you won't find flowers and humans or animals uh, on the Earth. You'll find single-celled creatures, single-celled organisms. These are thought to be fossil cells, three and a half billion years old. And um, these cells didn't organize themselves into complex structures, uh, multicellular structures that we see today. But over three and a half billion years, through the process of evolution, we end up you know, with this diversity of, of forms that we see around us, in the, this case being um, in the case of plants, but of course it applies to other aspects as well, such as the wonderful array of animals or insects or mammals, you name it. All of this arose through another transformative process, the process of evolution. So what are the principles, if we, if we distill down the principles of evolution, what are they? Well, what's, what's critical in evolution is, again, we have to deal with population. But in this case, we're dealing with a population of individuals. Individuals vary. In this case, these butterflies are not all exactly the same genetically. They vary, and they vary because of mutations, uh, sexual exchange, recombination of their DNA. All of these things change their genetic makeup, create variations in their genetic makeup. And so we, end, we need to think in terms of populations, not in terms of individuals, if we're going to understand evolution. So how do these variations lead to the evolution of butterflies or flowers? Well, we need some other notions. And one of the central notions we have is the notion of reproductive success. That is, that our variations are not at all equal in terms of their ability to reproduce. Okay, so some things reproduce more effectively than others. And if there's a gene, for example, that something an individual carries that promotes reproductive success, that increases the, the ability to reproduce, that will, boost, that will boost itself. So you'll have more copies of that gene, all right, which then further increase reproductive success, and so you end up with this positive loop of reinforcement. Reproductive success begets more reproductive success. But there's a limit to this process, okay? Darwin realized that uh, clearly, and Malthus uh, also uh, had something to do with that realization. Eventually, you hit limits because there are just so many organisms that, are, that, that the environment can sustain. And so consequently, this very success brings about its own limitations and puts a stopper on the system. All right, And it's that negative loop that then essentially allow, is critical for evolution to happen, because if it wasn't for that, you would end up with infinite populations, which, which, which don't happen. And moreover, you wouldn't end up with a sort of, uh, of a process, a recurrent process, in which genes continue to evolve. And moreover, we see that in that same logic, we've, we see the notion of population variation, but in this case, it's populations of individuals or genes. And persistence, in this case, we need some principle to, to carry on the um, genetic information from one generation to the next through the rules of inheritance. Okay, so we find again, when we look at this very basic level, we find the same loops that I've, that I've been describing for development, but now they're to do with evolution, evolution by natural selection. And again, it's about taking something relatively simple, or that seems relatively simple, and transforming it into something that looks a lot more complicated, be it a butterfly or a flower coming from individual cells way back in evolution. So these two processes, um, development and evolution, um, both seem to involve these feedback loops, this common type of fundamental logic. The, the populations that we're talking about are very different, but the fundamental logic of something reinforcing itself and bringing about its own limitations it can be seen to apply to both. And these two processes are also related to each other in another way because they're kind of embedded in each other. So if we look at the history of the Earth, the entire history of the Earth, which is about four and a half billion years ago, evolution is thought to have started about four billion years ago. The first primitive cells started to emerge. But it's only much more recent that development arose. Development arose maybe about a billion years ago. That is the production of complex multicellular organisms from simple, singular, single cell beginnings, all right? So that's a more recent innovation, as it were, compared to evolution. But both of them are transformative. They're both major transformations through which you take something relatively simple and turn it into something more complicated. Through its own internal logic, all right? So now, but there's a third transformation that I want to now touch on. Um, 
which also does this, and it doesn't apply so much to flowers, but it applies to everyone in this room and to many other animals as well. Uh, because you didn't all start off being able to walk, talk, uh, reason, and um, have conversations. You all started off as newborns. Um, and it's only through learning and interacting with your environment that you're now able to do all these amazing, these amazing things. So the process of learning is yet another very fundamental transformation that we find in biology. Okay? Learning, the ability to learn depended on development because we needed to develop brains all right, which are complex arrays of cells. And um, through, uh, the, through the development of brains, it became possible for certain types of organism, uh, may, namely animals with, with larger brains, to learn, to learn from, uh, learn from their environment, and transforming them from newborns, as it were, into more experienced individuals. So how does this process of learning work? How does a brain take itself all right, from something that's relatively naive into something that's a lot more sort of um, sophisticated? What are the principles? Well, again, we're going to be dealing with a population, but populations now of neurons. So this is a sort of a cartoon of, of neurons firing in the brain with all these sort of bright lights flashing, um, showing the transmission of these um, electrical signals down the nerve, nerve fibers. And when a signal arrives at a junction, these are the junctions between nerves, what happens is there's a release of chemicals that allows the signal from one neuron or nerve cell to be transmitted to the next neuron. Okay, so how does a population of neurons, which have this ability to communicate through these synapses or connections, how does this, how does learning operate based on something like this? Let's, let's try and look at the principles. Well, what I'm going to do is give you an experiment that was done um, 20, almost 25 years ago now, but a classic experiment that gave us a very important insight into how this works. Um, so this was done in 1990, and the experiment was you have a monkey, and the monkey's got a reward, an apple reward, and it learns that, you know, if it reaches up, it touches the apple, it, get, it gets the reward. And what Romo and Schultz were doing was they were recording for certain neurons in the monkey's brain as it was doing this. And what they found was there were particular neurons. These neurons produce a chemical called dopamine, um, and they noticed that these neurons fired um, and released dopamine at a particular time, okay? So I think this, yep. Well, let me do that again. So the firing activity of this neuron wasn't when the monkey reached up, but when it touched the food. When the monkey touched the food, the neuron fires. So you think, well, maybe this is a neuron, a brain cell that just responds to food. When you get the food or a reward, uh, when you touch, the, touch a reward, then the neuron fires. But then they did something else, which was much more surprising. They decided to put a door in front of the apple reward, so the monkey can't get the, the apple. Okay? But occasionally, they open the door and let the monkey get the apple. When the door opens, it makes a noise. Okay? And the monkey learns very quickly, that through conditioning, that the noise means reach up and get the apple. If I hear the door of the door opening, I go, I go and get the apple. That makes sense. So then they recorded from this neuron. So as before, before the monkey was conditioned, okay, the neuron doesn't fire at the sound of the door, doesn't fire when the monkey moves, but only when the monkey touches the apple, gets the reward. Okay, so that's, that's before conditioning. But now they looked after conditioning. So after a while, the, the monkey has learned, learned its trick. And what do they see? Well, now, well, let me do it like this. If, yes, it's the sound of the door that triggers the neuron, not the apple. So the, this neuron is not triggered by the apple. It's not triggered by the reward. It's now learned to predict the reward. That's quite a remarkable thing. A neuron is now firing in anticipation of an apple, of a reward. So how does that work? How can neurons, by, neurons are just cells interacting. How can they figure out how to anticipate something? What I'm going to do is take you through the sort of logic of what's going on. I'm aware this is going to be slightly uh, uh, brief. Uh, so don't worry if you don't get all the steps. The main thing is going to be the logic we come to at the end. OK, so how are we going to explain how neurons can, can learn? OK, so what, how do they have, what are the explanations? That, and here's the sort of best explanation we currently have. First, we're going to have a neuron, a yellow neuron here, that responds to the apple. All right, so that 
Um, and these curved lines, by the way, are the synapses, the connections. A long curved line means a good connection. So this apple, uh, when, when the monkey touches the food, it triggers the neuron and it releases dopamine. That's before the conditioning, this yellow neuron. To understand the response to the door, we're going to have to introduce another neuron. Okay, this neuron is, is able to respond or is connected to a whole series of different stimuli. It could be a door, it could be a cheese, smelly cheese, it could be a round sound of a bell, a light, a whole bunch of stuff. But it's connected to these with weak synapses. All right? These are weak short lines here, sh sh weak connections. So when are these things uh, triggers, it won't actually trigger the neurons. So when, for example, the door sounds, initially, this neuron won't do anything, okay? Because it's not, because that synapse is very weak, so the signal's not transmitted. So now to see what's going on, we're going to try and put these neurons together. So we'll put our yellow neuron with our green neuron, but we're going to have a, a rule such that when the yellow neuron fires, it's going to strengthen the synapse, the release of the dopamine, is going to cause a strengthening of the synapse of the connection of any signal, or right, anything, any neuron that fired just before the, the yellow neuron fired. Okay, the only thing that will have fired just before the yellow neuron will be the door. All right, because that's the thing that happened just before the apple reward was given. So let's just see that in action. So. The door, you'll see the first thing is the door opens, the sound is made, that doesn't trigger anything. But now the monkey touches the apple, touches the food, now that triggers, that releases the dopamine. The dopamine now strengthens that connection and only that connection because that's the one that was firing just before the yellow neuron fired. So that's, that's the principle. Let's just repeat that if we do that again and the monkey experiences this again. All right, door sounds, now that triggers that a little bit because it's got a stronger synapse. But now when it touches the food, again, it triggers the yellow neuron, and again, more dopamine. Now we've got a stronger synapse. Now if this carries on, okay, each time the monkey gets a reward, this synapse is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. It's going to get infinitely strong. So something's got, something's got to give. Okay? We've got to have some way of prevent... If this happened, then our, basically the, the, we'd buzz our brains it's sort of into, into sort of total excitement. Okay? So something's going to limit this process. So how do we limit this process? Well, we bring in a further interaction. We're going to start to make a loop here. And we're going to have a rule. We're going to say that this, this green neuron is going to stimulate the yellow neuron when, when, the, when, the, when the level of activity of this neuron is increasing. So when the neuron is increasing its firing rate, the green neuron, it's going to stimulate the, the yellow neuron. But when it's decreasing its firing rate, when it's going down in firing rate, it's going to inhibit the yellow neuron. All right, so what's going to happen? Well, we open the door. Now, because there's a strong synapse here, it's going to trigger this neuron. The neuron's going to increase in activity, and that's going to trigger the yellow neuron. All right? But now, when the reward comes, we'll find that this neuron is decreasing its, its activity because the door's no longer sounding, and that's going to um, inhibit this yellow neuron. OK, I know it's a bit complicated, but anyway, here, here it goes. Uh, maybe I just did that too quickly. Hold on. So let's let's see this. Okay. So the door sounds. That triggers. That stimulates. We get the dopamine. The food comes. Now it can't trigger anymore because this has become inhibitory. So we don't uh, trigger. So if we look at the firing activity now of our yellow neuron, it's now firing basically only when the door sounds and not when the food is given. And it's not firing here because it's being prevented from firing from this feedback loop. So now we've arrived at how a very, it looks maybe look a bit con contorted, the logic, but it's actually conceptually quite simple, a, a very simple and elegant way of explaining how, just through a set of neural interactions, we can shift the firing pattern from the neuron at one time to another time. And essentially, we're seeing learning in its, in its most essential form. Okay, so what's the principles behind this? Well, the issue that we're going to be concerned with is synaptic strength. How strong is our neural connection? All right, and um, what happens is that we have processes such as the firing of the dopamine neuron which increase the synaptic strength. They boost it. But eventually, that boosting process limits, all right, because that firing, it, that strengthening of the synapse kicks in an inhibitory reaction that counter, counteracts it so that it no longer is, is, is strengthened because the dopamine is no longer released at the, second, at the point that the food is delivered. 
All right, and we also have population variation. We have lots of different neurons we're dealing with, also lots of different experiences that the monkey is having. And we have persistence because these changes in strength of synapse persist. They don't just disappear as soon as they're made. There's a memory or a persistence of the synaptic changes. And so now we're seeing the same principles as I've shown you before, these twi twin feedback loops, but now applied to neurons and, and synaptic strengths. All right. Okay. So what I've tried to show you so far is that there are these three amazing transformations in life, the process of evolution, that you go from single cells into complex organism, the process of development, where you start off with a few cells that turn themselves within a lifetime into a flower or into a human, and then within a certain subgroup of animals, we have this process of learning, whereby uh, cells, can, neurons, can inter through interactions with their environment, can essentially capture certain trends or certain, start to predict certain aspects of what's happening in the world around them. All of these involve, as I've said, as I've tried to show you, certain common principles that I can capture with these uh, feedback loops. But now I want to turn to this fourth amazing transformation, the transformation of culture. Okay. Because um, if, we, if we went back about 10,000 years, if you were born 10,000 years ago, um, the, your brains would not be very different. In a sense, the brains you were born with would not be very different um, than the brains you currently have now, okay? Or the, the, the time of birth. The difference between us 10,000 years ago and, and today is not so much in the biology, but in the process of the culture that we've been exposed to, and the culture that's happened over or something like 10,000 years or more, all right? And this cultural change is incredibly uh, recent, okay? So um, you, t born 10,000 years ago, you would be sort of in a cave or whatever, sitting around a fire, probably having a good time, who knows? But you wouldn't be sitting in a lecture theater, right? And so this, this the first civilizations appeared um, extremely recently compared to the other processes that I've been talking about. So if you were to compress the entire history of the earth into one year, the first human civilizations appeared on the last minute of um, December the 31st. Okay, so it's, culture is incredibly recent as a, for, as a type of transformation, but it's another remarkable transformation that takes us from seemingly sort of simplistic beginnings to something that's, that seems to be much more elaborate. So what are the principles behind human culture? All right. And there have been many d accounts of what causes cultural change and theories of cultural change. But what I'm going to do is, is give you an account that's influenced really by the logic that I've been presenting with you um, so far. And I'm going to illustrate this logic with a particular example of culture. I've chosen a, a cultural example that's taken from the sort of height of what people might say, sort of classic cultural change, because I want to show you how even this sort of seemingly... Um, uh, a classic case of culture can also be th thought of in terms of the principles that I've been describing. So the example I want to give, it comes from 15th century Florence, where we had a very thriving population of individuals. And two individuals in particular that I want to talk about. One was uh, Andrea Verrocchio, and the other one was Antonio Polaiuolo. Both of these were goldsmiths. They were very successful goldsmiths at the time. They were making a very good living. Um, but they were rather ambitious, okay? So um, Polaiuolo, in particular, decided he wanted to sort of branch out and, and into new ventures, uh, not just be a goldsmith, and um, took up painting. In fact, he, he, he was a reasonably talented painter, and he had a brother, Piero, who was also uh, able to paint, and he started to churn out some paintings. And this is one of the paintings he produced, Tobias and the Angel, uh, by him and his brother, uh, you know, and it was very well received, you know, it became quite famous, it did really well. And Verrocchio um, got kind of rather envious and rather jealous of, of, of the success and thought, well, I can do this, okay? If, he can, if, if Paul Iwolo can become an artist, so, so can I. The trouble is, Verrocchio didn't really know how to paint. And so he uh, brought into his studio a number of apprentices, most famous of which is Leonardo da Vinci, and one of the first paintings that uh, Polaiuolo, sorry, <laughs> that Verrocchio produced is this 
Now, you don't you need to be a genius to see that there's some similarity between the two, all right? You can see uh, the arms, you know, the, the pose, the, even the dog. Leonardo's thought to have done the dog and maybe um, Tobias or parts of Tobias because uh, it was a collaboration between Verrocchio and Leonardo. But you'll see the two are very similar. And you might think, well, maybe there's two interpretations. One is that this was like a homage of Verrocchio to Paul I. Warlaw. But actually, it's more likely that he was kind of just showing Paul I. Warlaw how much better they could do this, um, this composition than Paul I. Warlaw. Because if you look at it, these, these, these figures are much more wooden um, and stilted than the figures of um, Verrocchio. Because he, he's kind of rubbing, rubbing um, Paul I. Warlaw's sort of face in it, really. Um, and that's ironic, because in a way, Verrocchio only took up painting all right, because of um, Paul Warlow's success. So, so the success of Paul Warlow sort of brought about its own competition, its own sort of, it, it brought about its own eclipse. And um, you'll not be surprised what I'm going to show you next, I hope, um, which is that we're dealing with our same fundamental logic. We have in this case in culture, we have a valued achievement. In this case, it would be a painting, but it could be any, anything that we value uh, as a society that has something is valued and we're successful with this. We communicate, we tell others about it. There's no point in not telling others about it because it just won't be valued, all right? So, so we, we communicate the success, but in so doing, uh, we also bring about competition, all right? And that, that feeds back into the system and so that just moves it to the next stage. And so you have these double feedback loops, exactly as we've seen before, between something that boosts itself, but at the same time, through that very process brings about its own sort of, um, it becomes a victim of its own success. And we're dealing again with populations, but now we're dealing with populations of individuals, uh, of, of a human population. And the, the, they're different. Not everybody's the same because of their experiences, because of their makeup. Um, you couldn't have cultural evolution with one individual. Okay? You, you need a society, a population of individuals interacting. And uh, finally, we have persistence. The things that we make or the, the valued achievements have to persist. If they vanish straight away, they're, they're of no long-term significance. Paintings last because of their material. Uh, they last for a while. You, you might last in print. You might last on the internet. It doesn't matter. There has to be some way of perpetuating your achievement. All right, so I call these the twin feedback loops of culture, for culture. So what we're seeing then is when we look at all these processes of transformation, where we go from relatively simple things to more complex, and we look at the internal logic of what's driving this, we see some common, common features. So when I, when I started, I, I showed you this example of the, of the Snapdragon and the, and the iPhone, and said how different they were in a way, because the Snapdragon makes itself, and the iPhone doesn't. But in a sense, both of them are products of these transformative processes that I've been talking about. The Snapdragon flower, is a product of two transformations in this way, the process of evolution and the process of development that I covered earlier on. The iPhone is a product of four transformations. Okay? There's the product of evolution, all right, that, through which humans evolved. There's the process of development, through which humans develop from fertilized eggs. There's a process of learning, through which we learn as we, when, when we're born and interacting with our environment. And then, of course, there's the process of cultural change that led ultimately to, to, to the technology that allowed us to produce the iPhone, which is a product of cultural change. Okay. So these two the processes are connected, and they're connected by not only uh, by these different processes, but by this common fundamental logic that, he, that, that um, I'm trying to... Uh, uh, say it underlies all of these transformative processes. They're all transformative because, in a sense, they reflect this, this same underlying uh, logic. I've shown you, I've talked about four of the key elements of this. There are other elements um, called recurrence, cooperation, and combinatorial richness that again apply to all these processes, but I don't have time to go into those, but um, it's covered in the book, um, as are all the things that I've said, but in, in, in greater depth. And together, these various processes that are common to these transformations, I call life's creative recipe. It's, it's the way that life sort of boosts itself from one state to another, transforms itself. And there are these four ways that we, we see this happening, evolution, development, 
learning and cultural change, but they all revolve around a similar type of logic. Now, before finishing, I just want to say a, a few things about the danger of drawing comparisons like this between these very disparate fields, because people don't normally make these connections between these four very different types of transformations that we see. When you're comparing different processes, you have to be careful to compare them in the right, at the right level. So here, for example, we, if we can compare war, sometimes compared with chess, okay, they're both territorial sort of activities where something's trying to take over territory of something else. Um, uh, they're highly competitive. Often you have two different sides competing um, for, this, for, the, for, for, the, for the prize. But, uh, so we see certain similarities, but it would be wrong to draw these similarities too closely. For example, you could say, well, look, the horse in chess is very similar to a horse in war. Okay, so maybe they're, maybe they're similar at that level as well. All right? But we know that this isn't fundamental to their similarity because you know, we can replace those chess pieces with something that doesn't have a horse. The logic would still be exactly the same. Okay? So what we're dealing with when we're comparing chess and war, we need to be careful that we compare the right level of, what, of abstraction. We're dealing with a relationship in form, not a relationship of detail. And similarly, the sorts of comparisons I'm making when I'm comparing these different processes of evolution and so forth, I'm not trying to say that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this process in evolution and this process in culture or this process in development. I'm trying to say that there's an overall formal similarity in the way all these things operate that takes us from these simple beginnings to these more complicated states through this sort of internal logic. Okay, so I tried to show you, you know, show you how these d different um, processes are related to each other through this um, internal logic. Um, but finally, I'd like to sort of say something about culture, because culture is rather unusual among these uh, different transformations. I've kind of, the way I've given the talk is to say, well, first comes evolution, then development is embedded in, 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 in evolution, then we have learning which is embedded in development, because we need brains that develop. And then culture is embedded in learning, because you need to be able to learn in order to be able to transmit what you know uh, to others uh, through culture. But culture is rather unusual, because it's not just the product of all these uh, processes. Um, it's not just the, the sort of the nested within them. It's necessary for us to appreciate all these other processes, because everything I've told you I've been talking about science, okay? but science and our understanding, our scientific understanding, is also a product of culture. Okay? So the way we look at the world, the way we try and comprehend all of these processes that I've been describing, we see them through the eyes of culture. Because without humans working together to figure out science, and the scientific process, we, I wouldn't be telling you all of this. So culture is very peculiar. It's, it's both the product, in a sense, of these transformations, or it lies within these transformations, but it's also the transformation that allows us to appreciate all the transformations that gave rise to it. And so, it, to me, it reminds me of this picture of, of Escher, um, of a man looking at a picture of which he is a part. All right? And to me, this symbolizes really where we are, both as scientists and, uh, and also in terms of the, the arts or any aspect of trying to make sense of the world. We're born into this very peculiar world with all this stuff going around that we're trying to make sense of, whether we're scientists, or we might be artists responding to that world. Um, so we're faced with this, but at the same time, we are part of the very world that we're trying to react to and comprehend. All right, and what I'm trying to, what I've tried to convince you is, is that that's really, um, that, to me, that's not a problem. You might say, oh dear, it's all very circular, oh dear. But you might say, well, actually, that's, that's just an amazing feature of being, being alive, all right, that we are, are, are fascinated by this thing around us, but at the same time, we can appreciate that we are the product uh, and a part of the thing that we are ourselves trying to understand. And to me, that's true of whether you're a scientist or from... Um, uh, you come from a different field. We're all, in a sense, in that same game. Science can give us maybe some clearer insights into some of the principles that lie behind that conundrum, but it continues to fascinate us, and I think it will continue to do so for many more years to come. So thank you very much. I think I'll finish there. Thank you. Um, there must surely be some degree of learning in development. 
um, is there a degree of learning and development? Yeah. I think it depends on what you mean by learning. Mm. Okay. So take a plant, for example. A plant uh, responds to its environment. Mm. Uh, for example, it will flower in the spring, or uh, it may have some... If you do something to a plant, it may change its behavior as a consequence, or its growth, or whatever. That's not the same as learning in the sense that, that I'm talking about. Learning, is, because a lot of these responses of a plant are, have been put there through evolution, all right? The, the, over many generations, natural selection has ensured that plants react that way. So, for example, if you mow the lawn, you start the, the, mow, the lawn mower, all right? You might, if plants could learn, they'd hear this noise, assuming they could hear, but they can't, never mind. If they could, they'd duck, okay? <laughs> they'd learn to duck, because every time they don't, you know, they get, they get you know, it's painful. <laughs> but they never learn to duck, okay? A plant will not learn to duck. It's not just because it can't hear, okay? It can't learn to duck because it can't absorb a new arbitrary signal, okay? So learning is not just about responding, not even about being, having a history of response. It's about learning something arbitrary, a new, a, new, a new association that was never accounted for, never encountered in the past during evolution. All right, so lawnmowers were never encountered. Microphones were never encountered in, the evolutionary, in our long evolution, and yet you learn how to use them. So in that sense, plants are unable to learn. In that sense, development on its own, it can't extract something new, but it can be extremely responsive. So that would be my, my argument. I would love to know of an example of learning, genuine learning happening during development, and by that I mean you give some, some stimulus that the plant or the organism has never encountered before, and the organism then can learn to respond to that stimulus. I don't know of any example. But that would suggest that the response of the same type of organism is always exactly the same to the same type of stimulus. Would that be right? It, in other words, they never vary according to what's happened before. Oh, no, it doesn't. it doesn't mean that the response is always the same. The response can change, it can evolve, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can put the plant in, in the one condition, it will respond in a certain way, in a different condition, in a different way, or if its genetic makeup is different, if it's a vari variation, then it will respond different. It doesn't mean the response is always the same. It just means you can't rewire your response in a single, in a single generation. You can only rewire it, you improve your response over multiple generations. Um, so it doesn't mean it's inflexible, it doesn't mean it's fixed for all time, it just means the time scale is bigger. It's on a, happening on an evolutionary time scale rather than on the, on the short time scale that we, or animals, I mean, not, not just humans, sure. you know, dogs, whatever, rats, all these slugs, they can all learn. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, we know that if there's a stimulant, like, the door opening in the example of the monkey looking for his fruit, um, that if only a number of times uh, the fruit actually follows after that stimulant, um, look, uh, looking for that stimulant actually becomes more addictive? Is that because um, it's irritating at some level to not get the fruit after you've already had the do dopamine released in okay. the brain? So is, well, uh, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at, but if you're, are you, if you're asking, is learning addictive, in a sense? Is there an addictive aspect? You're not asking about that. No. You're asking why, do, go on, sorry. Um, well, in your example, the monkey would always get the fruit after the door had been opened. Mm -hmm. But we know that if the fruit getting is sort of unpredictable, then seeking out the stimulant of um, the door opening, if the monkey has some control over that, uh, is more, the, the, the monkey puts more energy actually in that even though it's less likely that he gets the, the reward of the fruit. So you're saying if he's uncertain yeah. as to whether he will get the fruit, what does the effect that that have? And you're right. So well, let's suppose, for example, after learning to get the fruit a few times, he doesn't get. He puts his hand up. The door opens. Here's the thing. What happens? Actually, what happens is that the dopamine. There's a drop in dopamine. Why is there a drop? That's predicted by the model. 
Because what happens now is the inhibition comes still, but there's no reward coming from the, I don't know if you remember it. Oh, there's yeah. A, there's a, all right, so now actually the, the monkey feels depressed, okay? Because, poor monkey. Poor monkey, because he feels, I was expecting, I was expecting uh, an apple, and now I'm not getting an apple. So actually, uh, the pleasures that we get are all about our expectations. So this model actually, have, what it tells you is, what you're really rewarding is the unexpected. If you expect something, actually, that thing no longer becomes the reward, okay? Because you expect it. What's actually interesting for the monkey is when the door sounds, because you think, ah, it doesn't, it can't predict the door sound. So the door sound tells it, ooh, yeah. food's on the way. That's when the dopamine is released, mm -hmm. all right? In anticipation of the fact the food actually is rather boring. And, and we all have that experience. We anticipate, and actually, it's the anticipation sometimes that, that is more exciting than the, than the reward. But dopamine is also, is, is very strongly implicated in addiction, okay? So, it's, so a lot of drugs uh, operate, like cocaine, operate through the dopamine system. So a lot of our addictions are due to the fact that we're looking as a word for rewards. So this reward system is incredibly powerful in terms of driving what we do, all right? Whether it's the appoint disappointments or pleasures, they all seem to be related to this type of uh, reward system. Thank you. I think there's a question here at the front. Yes, many years ago when I was at the university, it was very clear cut science and arts and religion. So uh, we knew more where we stand. And I think um, um, now it's very interesting for me, but it's also puzzling because uh, it's more blurred, the edges, and they all interact. And I can see, yes, the, the ways of doing it and the, that uh, they, they are okay. <laughs> but um, also it's like, well, then knowledge is very relative, it's like Einstein and the theory of the relativity. So um, many, in many years ahead, in the future, I don't know where it's going to, to lead us. Mm -hmm. It's going to be more blurred and then the artists could uh, go and work in the lab and invent split the, the atom or uh, produce or what? Yeah, or, and so then will we all become, call the, yeah. the bomb, the explosion of the bomb, an art as well? Or it's a bit, uh, it's interesting, but puzzling, and sometimes thinking, hmm, not so sure about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> about no, I think that this the, the relationship between science and art has a sort of, yeah, very volatile relationship. If you go back, for example, to Leonardo, he was doing both art and science, all right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the case that, that it's a new thing that you should be mixing these, these notions. I think there's a difference between trying to see commonalities, and it goes back to what I was saying about the chess, and saying they're the same. They're not the same, yeah. okay? And one of the important differences is that you can, in, in science, you can be wrong. I mean, you can say this, this idea so you do experiments, you say this, this, this is wrong. Okay, we tested experimentally. I, I gave you some ideas about how I think a snapdragon grows. Maybe they're wrong. Some, uh, uh, another scientist can come along and say, no, we disagree, we've done this experiment, it disproves the way you're thinking about it. I can't disprove a painting. I can't say that that painting is bad. I can say that's my opinion that it's bad, but there isn't a sort of like a consensus view. Uh, we don't evaluate art objects in the same way we evaluate scientific theory. Scientific theory is subject to this test, which, is, which people can all agree, agree about usually, uh, whereas a painting, you know, people can decide they like it or they, or they don't like it. So it doesn't mean that you evaluate them in the same way. But, so there are differences, but the question is, just because there are differences doesn't mean there aren't also similarities. So you don't need to say things are the same to see that actually there are connections between them. And so to me, they're, they're, they're both aspects of us trying to make sense of what's around us. And I think one of the, the mistakes people make, actually, about science um, is to think that science is this, is this impersonal thing, all right, that is, you know, like op floats independently of people. I, d I disagree with that view. I think it's often the way we teach science as, as this impersonal way. This, this is the case, the water pours like this, gravity works like this. But the way science is discovered is through humans trying to figure out and with, with all their emotions and worries and so forth. They arrive at their science 
in a way that's not so different from the way somebody might arrive at a painting or, or, or something else. I'm saying the evaluation is different. The skills are different. I'm not saying any, but I'm saying realizing that science is at the end of the day a human, a human activity just like these others and, and reflects the curiosity of humans or the, the reaction of humans to try and make sense of what's around them. All of those things I think are shared with the arts, but for, for sure we shouldn't say that they're the same. It's just seeing certain unities rather than divisions. Some people like to yes. keep them totally separate, by the way. Some people feel very uncomfortable, and that's their choice. No, 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 I agree. It's just that sometimes it could be interpreted as well as, oh, it's in a fashion now, like everything. Yeah, and no, it, you're right. Pass, you know? You're absolutely but, right. Uh, it's fascinating, yes. There are people, I know scientists, who would want to keep art and science completely separate because they would want to keep science as this pure, sort of crystalline knowledge that shouldn't be contaminated be with the subjective right, emotional yes. stuff, okay? So there are all sorts of different people that take different views. So yes. what you're hearing is, a, is just a personal view that I think some people share, but maybe not all scientists. Mm -hmm. Just um, one behind and then... So, sorry, is synapt um, synap <laughs> synaptic strengthening a irreversible process? No. So synapses can weaken over time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you could never forget. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so certain connections can either passively be weakened just mm -hmm. through time, um, or they could be weakened through contrary learning. In other words, that actually, if the monkey realizes after a while that it's it's that the door is not giving it. Um, an apple reward, then that synapse will weaken. Yeah. So no, they, they can strengthen and they can weaken. In fact, the logic that I described really only works if it can go both ways. So they can both self-boost, but also if they're not boosted, they will eventually decay. Some strength, some can stay for a, a very long, long time, mm. all right, and have very long um, decay lengths. So, so you can still remember certain things that happened to you, you know, in your in your in your early childhood. So, um, but, but in general, for, for learning to operate, it can, they can both strengthen and weaken. So just because one of, the, one of the things I notice, if you look at the four sort of different levels that you're looking at um, sort of development, yeah. is also this idea of you could have cycles. So in evolution, where you have um, evolutionary pressures that are increasing and then decreasing, you're going to get a cycle of uh, a particular trait evolving in a sort of a group of organisms, for example. I just think like in culture, fashion goes in cycles. Mm -hmm. You know, look at clothing now that people wear, people also wearing 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then also from a learning point of view, the people do learn in cycles. They sort of learn something and then almost you sort of feel like you forget it and relearn it again. And so you sort of got an extra layer of complexity on top. I yeah. think this issue of cycles is cl in fashion and so forth is, is related to this issue of novelty. Mm. So something's novel, and incidentally you see this almost in any human activity, you know, something becomes novel and then it's reinvented, you know, 30 years later, okay? So what happens is that it's, it's novel and it's related, to the, so, so people think, oh, that's new, so it boosts mm. itself and then it becomes a victim of its own success. It's actually a consequence of the things that I've been talking about. Mm. So as, it, and then gradually everyone thinks, hey, this is no longer novel, all right? And if novelty is important, as it is in many of these cases, then what that does is mean that, that that novelty is no longer valued because it's no longer novel. And so you move on to something else. Now, it may be over a period of time that people forget all right, <laughs> what was novel, and so it comes back again as novel, mm -hmm. in a sense, through a sort of collective memory loss. And so you see people say, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And people think, well, why is that cool? You know, it's people were dressing like this um, you know, 30 years ago or whatever. So I'm waiting, by the way, for, for flares to come back in. You know, I remember, <laughs> you know, in the 70s, these, these amazing flares. I've never, that hasn't come back in, interestingly. <laughs> so certain things don't come back. Maybe it will. Maybe tomorrow we'll see it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this cyclic aspect is, is, is really part of that same. And in a sense, the fact that I'm dealing with loops yeah. uh, allows, for that, allows for that to happen. Could you pass the microphone one row back, please? Thank you. Um, so you're talking about the different levels of transformation depending on each other in a sort of linear fashion. Um, but how much do they, they feed back into each other? For example, I know you're saying that culture allows us to reflect on them, but does it have an impact on uh, the transformations themselves? For example, um, the impact of culture on evolution mm. or culture on, on the, our ability to learn? No, I think... Um, 
No, you're right. That's a very good point. Because culture clearly can affect um, evolution in the sense that it, it affects reproduction. All right, our patterns of reproduction, and through pat our patterns of reproduction, it may, it may affect evolution. Um, it's likely to have certain effects on a much longer time scale than, than just a single generation. All right? But already, you might say, certain cultural change, for example, people that have diseases that couldn't have survived without medicine, with certain medication, they would not have reproduced maybe, or they would have died at an early age, and now they can survive. So in that sense, um, absolutely culture can, can influence evolution. It can influence uh, development in the sense that you might you know, give a drug well, we, you know, a drug developed in culture that then is taken that has a developmental, sometimes usually adverse developmental effect. So, no, there is absolutely um, inter interplay between these different, different processes, and one, in a sense, can feed back or be part of the other. In fact, this separation that I make is maybe slightly artificial. It's a good way for us to sort of conceptually separate these things, but there are inter sort of arrows, as it were, that run between them as well, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sorry, could you pass it one further back? Thank you. Uh, when you then said that um, the grass would duck if it could when it heard the lawnmower, can I just ask you, do your snapdragons feel pain? Do snapdragons feel pain? Uh, um, I think not, okay, because I think pain is associated with brains, okay, and pain has a certain function which has to do with learning. So why do we feel pain, okay? Um, it's kind of, you know, why, why, why would biology give us this rather negative feeling? Well, it makes sense if you want to learn, okay? So just as you learn from rewards, okay, if we, if we learn that certain things are pain, or if we have pain, and these things that are painful usually are to our detriment in terms of our survival and reproduction, the basic things. So if somebody stabs me, it's not going to enhance my survival ability. Um, so pain uh, is related, all right, to our survival. And so what we do is we learn to avoid pain. It's there for a reason. It's to help us. It provides a sort of proxy to say, okay, that was a bad idea, okay? And that's going to, in general, that's going to increase your survival and reproduction. So evolution has put pain there for a reason, a very good reason. It actually helps us survive. Just as it's put rewards there for a reason, our feeling reward is there for a reason. Now, I don't think, because I don't believe that, grass ducks, or that plant, plant <laughs> grass ducks, that sounds funny, um, that plants learn, I don't think they feel pain for exactly that reason, all right, that it doesn't make sense. Of course, lots of things you, you don't figure out, and later on you find they, okay, I'm not, but I'm just saying from where I see it, I don't think plants feel pleasure or pain because they can't learn, okay, and those two things are related to our, to our, learning, our learning ability. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I, lo I love the, the grand scale of what, what you've been telling us um, uh, about the possibility that these, these four principles you talked about, and then there's the three other ones in the book you didn't even have time to talk about, apply to all the, the, these great phenomena uh, from the evolution, development, learning, and culture. I'm just trying to sit here, and it seems to me very appealing, and almost, you must be right. <laughs> it's very compelling. Um, so we're, what I really wanted to ask, uh, and this is more maybe kind of playing the devil's advocate or trying to, mm. try, trying to be a bit more critical, do you see it as, as this kind of set of logic that almost kind of must be true, almost a, a truism at one scale? Or could it be a, a scientific hypothesis which is falsifiable? In other words, mm. could you be wrong? Mm. <laughs> what would show you were wrong about, about these principles. So, um, Is that a fair question? No, no, it's an absolutely fair question. Is it a truism? Um, so the first thing is that actually nobody has come up with this truism before. Okay? It, they have compared evolution and um, cultural change. Okay? But the bringing all these processes together has not been done before. So in that sense, if it is a truism, it hasn't been trivially obvious um, to, to everyone. Um, can it be wrong? I think each of my processes, it, it is, in a sense, uh, it is a way of looking at the world. It's a way of looking at things. And in that sense, you don't need to look at the world this way. Okay, so, so what is wrong? What, what you mean by wrong is, well, this makes sense if I look at it this way. It makes more sense to me if I look at something this way than if I look at it that way. That's a weaker statement than this is wrong. It's just saying, hey, this makes a lot more sense than this. I'm not saying that this is the wrong way of looking at it, I'm just saying 
it's, it's, it's maybe a, a good way of thinking about these relationships. So in that sense, I can't give an experiment that would disprove what I'm saying, okay? But it could be, if it turned out not to be useful, if it turned out that everyone said, hey, look, you know, you've been going, ravaging on about this way of looking at things. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't help anybody understand the relationships between these things. Then I would have to say, in that sense, it's wrong, because it's not helpful. But I think it is, I'm biased, of course, um, I think it is helpful because you are able to see relationships in a way that you couldn't um, maybe appreciate if you, if, you didn't, if you didn't view it this way. And they haven't tended to be appreciated. They pretended to be put in their own separate little containers. And that kind of, funnily enough, actually, one of the consequences of this is, it, is that humans like to feel very special. Okay? We like to feel we're very, very, we are very special, of course. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that maybe when you look at things in this way, that the things that we see as so special to us, like culture and so forth, are actually set in a broader context. And it's kind of sort of seeing ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a bigger picture than just with the special people that come up with these amazing creative ideas and this culture and so forth that's disconnected from everything else. So really what I'm trying to say is, is to make people, is to encourage people to see the connections that I think are helpful in terms of understanding all of these processes, but I don't think I can say that this is right, all right? <laughs> I can say it's, it's, a, it's a perspective on relating these different things that you can't really test in that sort of very narrow sense. I think we have time for approximately one more question, and maybe two if it's a short one. So the gentleman in the red shirt. Thanks. So um, all the process and aspects that you've spoken of refer to life. Hmm. Um, I'd just be interested to, to know how you would define the beginning of life. Um, you spoke of on a molecular level about molecules which replicate themselves. So where would you say life begins separate from chemistry mm -hmm. or physics? So, um, first of all, yeah, do all, well, I, I talked about life, and uh, it, actually I think some of the principles I'm talking about are not restricted to life, okay? You'll find them in certain elements of what I've described, uh, for example, in the formation of a sand dune, or, or even the planets, or the, the, the universe. There are certain principles that, that um, relate to inanimate life, in, inanimate life, that's not right, but the inanimate world as well, but they're brought together with a particular force um, in these living transformations, and this force really um, stems ultimately from the evolutionary process in which this first started to happen. But you raised another question, what is the line between you know, life and, and not life? And people have sort of speculated on all these things, but my view actually is that there isn't a line, okay? Um, we want a line. It's very interesting. We like lines. We like to say, okay, this is like this, and this is like this, and there's a line between them. But why, why, do, we, why do we do this? And um, it's to do with the way we categorize the world. Okay, we like to categorize things. So that's a bottle, that's a glass. Uh, we love lines. Okay, we love saying there are categories. But actually, a lot of processes, particularly the ones that I've been talking about, where you've got a feedback loop, where something builds up on itself, there isn't a line. You, ha you have sort of a constellation of factors that come together, that together start to interact and boost themselves and so forth. So it's the same way. So when, when did painting start? Okay, well, when was the first painting? Was it the first time somebody scribbled something in the sand with a twig? Was that the beginning of painting? You know, when, you know, if you ask any, any of these things, you can't, uh, well, that is drawing a line, but I mean, you, ca you, can't, <laughs> you can't identify this. I think the same is true of, of what, what we are as human species. When did, the human, when did we first become human? I think these are all the same, same sort of questions. We're seeking for something that actually, to my mind, isn't there. And it's not there because we're not dealing with a switch that goes from A to B. We're dealing with, a, with feedback loops. And by their nature, loops do not have beginnings. Okay? And so that's why I can't really give you a discrete answer, because I don't think there is one. If there's a last pressing question, we'll take it. Otherwise, I... Th oh, yes, OK. On the front row. Short question. Where does the meme concept fit into all of this? Where does the meme concept? Um, well, actually, we were discussing this earlier. Um, so the meme idea w was... 
was Richard Dawkins' idea that when he compared cultural evolution to uh, cultural change to biological evolution, he said that there are these things called memes that were equivalent to genes, which are like ideas that get transmitted from one person to another. Um, I think the idea that cultural evolution involves the transmission of ideas and concepts and learning and so forth, I totally subscribe to. I'm not convinced that calling it a meme, I think Dawkins actually originally did it slightly, slightly jokingly, okay? To sort of bring forth, he's, he's very good at doing this, he sort of uses something to sort of make something more vivid. But if you push that idea too far, then I think it turns out to be rather vacuous, all right? Uh, rather like the horse, uh, the horse comparison I was saying between the chess and war. If you try and define it too narrowly, it ceases to be helpful. Because then you start to say, what is a meme? Okay, and then they say, well, a meme is an idea that spreads, but, but what, you know, what determines whether it spreads? And so if you, if, you, if, you, if you ask yourself what your definition of a meme is, uh, it either becomes a sort of just self, uh, sort of anything that spreads becomes a meme. And then by definition, everything's a meme. So I'm not sure how useful, I've never found that concept particularly useful. Some people do. So I think what is useful is the, is the idea that ideas and, and, and cultural uh, creations interact and compete and, and can, can become prevalent and not. I wouldn't myself encapsulate it as a word that, that parallels the gene, because I just don't think that that's, that's the right level, the most useful level of comparison. But that's, that's my personal view. Perhaps you'd like to join me in thanking Enrique Cohn very much for a very illuminating evening. Enrique, thank you.